Let's update on some of the prospects who got promoted to the big leagues after spring training. And then let's look at some guys who were going to get called up pretty soon. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer for Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And today's episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked on Sports listeners get $50 off of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagement jewelry. Use code Locked on at checkout. So, We've talked plenty on this show about the guys who made the team out of spring training. Your Jeremy Pena's, your Bobby Witts, your Julio Rodriguez. Let's talk about some of these guys that were called up later and and how they're doing. I think let's start in St. Louis. So second baseman Nolan Gorman is a guy that we wondered would he make the team out of spring training and would there be a spot for him and then some injuries, some ineffectiveness. They called him up and... All of these stats, by the way, are through uh, Tuesday midday. So if they played a game Tuesday night, they're not included in this. Uh, But as of right now, um, Nolan Gorman, uh, 10 games in the field, 12 of 31, two home runs, nine runs, and seven RBI. So offensively, he's performing decently. But caveat here, he's sitting against lefties. So he's not playing against lefties for the most part. He's doing all of his damage against righties. And uh, this is compounded, and if you remember the scouting report, some of this is compounded with the defensive struggles. We talked about, obviously, he was a corner infielder. Uh, They had to move him because you have a Paul Goldschmidt and a Nolan Arenado at the corners, so they've moved him to second base. Uh, Results have been mixed. 10 games at second base. He's had 77 total innings in the big leagues at second base. Already has three errors. uh, Has a 927 fielding percentage. So, Nolan Gorman. Offensively, for the most part, having the start you want. Flashing some power. uh, Able to get on base. Defensively, uh, he's he's staying right now despite the defense. And you have to wonder, uh, at what point in time do the the offensive contributions get outweighed by the defensive struggles? Uh, They have not hit that point yet with Nolan Gorman, and I don't necessarily know what it's going to be. I think if he continues to produce like this, he's probably, they're probably going to have a pretty long leash when it comes to defensively, what can he do? Another guy, a little bit of of a a sooner call-up, but kind of similar sample size, is Adley Rutschman, the catcher for the Orioles. Number one prospect. We expected him to make the team out of spring training, Uh, You saw triceps injury, sidelined him for weeks, finally got a chance, went to double A in rehab, spent a little bit of time in triple A, and is now in the big leagues. Uh, First professional hit was a triple, just like Manny Machado and uh, Matt Wieters. And so right now, he's played nine games, seven of 35, um, one triple, one double, no home runs yet. But from everything that I've read, everything that I've seen, uh, He's performing to the level you would expect a rookie catcher to perform to. He's he's showing an understanding of how to manage the pitching staff. Uh, he's handling the game defensively. He's doing enough. And so I think this is just a matter of just has to settle into a groove a bit. Uh, he did have a kind of a difficult go at it facing the Yankees pretty quickly after coming up. Obviously the red hot Yankees. So I think Adley Rutschman's doing fine. You don't get to the point of being a number one prospect unless you kind of have some of that talent and unless there's not a ton of concern there with you. So I'm not going into this concerned about about Adley Rutschman and and his ability to stick. Uh, I mean, what's he going to do? Lose the division for Baltimore? Um, <laughs> it's at a certain point, there's no harm in letting him learn on the job. I think he'll be fine. A guy who <clears throat> who is learning on the job and is doing well of it I think, is out in Arizona, and it's outfielder Alex Thomas. So, uh, called up, I think he's had, um, he's had about, just just under 200 innings out there in the outfield now. 
But uh, 18 of 70 offensively, five doubles, three home runs. Uh, on the, you know, he's uh, six RBIs. And then on the base pass, he scored 10 runs. And it's something where uh, he's hitting a little bit lower in the order. So he's behind your, you know, he's not hitting up at the, up at the top with the Pavin Smith and the Christian Walker and the uh, Dalton Varsho and the Josh uh, Rojas. He's hitting a little bit lower. So he's not getting the chance to drive guys in. And that's why his RBI count is so low, but his run count is so high because if you're bat seventh or eighth or ninth, you're you're on base for those guys to bring you in. But uh, he's doing enough. He's not, you don't see any um, any toot blondes out there. He's not getting picked off. Um, he's running the bases well, kind of what we expected. And then defensively, he's been as good as advertised. I mean, 178 innings now. I think he's got one error in, the, in that entire time. So, a little bit of a contrast to Nolan Gorman. He's given you defensive value. And offensively, he's kind of, you know, he's not hitting as prolifically as a guy like a Nolan Gorman, but he's doing enough where you're not worried about him tanking your season by being out there in center field. Um, talking about being out there in center field and kind of tanking a, um, tanking a, I'm not saying tanking a season. He's not doing that. But Christian Pache, um, other big piece of the trade for Matt Olson from the Athletics to the Braves, along with Shea Langoliers. Pache's been in the bigs just about the entire um, the entire season so far, about 47 games. It's batting 170, 213, 245. It's not a really good look. Um, defensively, he's been perfectly fine. I mean, he's out there, 992 fielding percentage, one error in that giant outfield uh, that Oakland has, but offensively just can't seem to figure it out at the plate. And it kind of goes back to that was some of the knock on him in Atlanta. Uh, he played well in the 2020 playoffs when he got called on last minute in the NLCS against the Dodgers. They went into 2021 thinking he was going to be the guy in center. Struggled pretty badly early, got hurt. They sent him down, didn't bring him up the rest of the year. You saw how desperate they were for outfielders uh, midseason. They were playing Orlando Arcia. Uh, the uh, the utility infielder playing him in the outfield and then went and traded for four outfielders. That's how uh, that's how desperate they were for outfielders and they didn't call Pache back up. So, in retrospect, probably was a sign that Atlanta didn't think offensively he could contribute and he's kind of shown that so far um, in Oakland. So, he kind of has some work to do offensively to figure that out. A guy that is doing work offensively, uh, figuring some stuff out, is George Kirby. So I've been really interested in George Kirby, uh, kind of what he's done. Obviously, very heralded prospect. Um, really excited to see what he do for Seattle. And four games so far, he starts on Tuesday. So this is not counting that start on Tuesday. But uh, four games, he's 0-1 with a 4-5 ERA. And when you're looking, the Mariners have been on a skid I don't necessarily think you can look too much at the win-loss record or maybe even so much the ERA, more as you're looking at the process here when it comes to the to the pitcher. And 20 innings pitched, three home runs, and then he's got two walks to 20 strikeouts. So I like the control, not walking guys. A uh, couple observations I have, though. If you go back and you kind of look at the way some of these starts have broken up, uh, the two things is... One, he needs the changeup command to be there. He's a better pitcher when the changeup command is there. But I think even bigger than that, he needs to throw the fastball more. I know that baseball as a whole is trending away from the fastball. It's becoming more of a breaking pitch uh, and off-speed dominant game. And there's a few teams now who their pitching staffs throw the fastball less than 50% of the time. But George Kirby is an outlier to this. So... You can go back and you can break his starts up into two separate groups. Um, Starts where he threw the fastball less than 50% of the time. And fastball where... uh, Starts where he threw the fastball more than 60% of the time. So when he threw the fastball less than 50% of the time, nine innings pitched, four strikeouts to two walks. Got roughed up by the Mets. You know, kind of struggled a bit there. Didn't necessarily think it was... Um, as as good of an out as it could have been. And then the two starts where he threw the ball, or he threw the fastball more than 60% of the time, 11 innings pitched, 16 strikeouts, zero walks. 
Uh, the advanced numbers on the fastball are really good. He gets a lot of movement with it, a lot of deception with it, a lot of swing and miss to it. And it's something where the change of command has to be there, but he has to throw the fastball more. And, and, and I understand that the game is going away from that, but this is where this like the pitching coach comes in. This is the role of the pitching coach to figure out what works for each player and what doesn't work and get them to do the things that work. The fastball of George Kirby works. The four-seam fastball works. Throw it more often. In just a minute, I want to get to some of the lesser heralded prospects um, and how they've been doing in their time in the majors. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Blue Nile. So, uh, whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, you can find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. So if you're looking at the engagement jewelry, uh, Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as the setting style. And then Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft her perfect engagement ring because every ring from Blue Nile is one of a kind. If you're wanting to celebrate life's special moments with fine jewelry, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat, to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. If you wake up at 3 in the morning and realize, holy cow, I've got an anniversary coming up, I've got to buy something, you can call Blue Nile and they will help you find something. So, make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. Locked on MLB listeners get $50 off a purchase of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagement jewelry. Use code Locked On. that's code Locked On. plus every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that will not give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Okay, so... Some of the lesser heralded prospects who have been up uh, for a little bit this season and are doing well. First one I want to talk about, Spencer Strider. Really interesting here. One, the mustache is great. Holy cow. Love that mustache. No, 35th, 35th round pick by the Indians in 2017. Um, skipped that, went to Clemson. Was a fourth round pick of the Braves in 2020. Came up this year. And, you know, had a, like a cup of coffee last year. But, you know, this year. The thing here, so right now, 1-2, and 3-4-5 ERA over 12 games with one start. And this is a place where the advanced statistics are, no, advanced statistics, the overall stat line's a little misleading. So 28 and two-thirds innings on the year, 11 earned runs, 13 walks to 44 strikeouts. But... He got his first start of the season on Monday at Arizona and got charged with five earned runs. And I don't necessarily think he should have. So a uh, couple guys get on via bad plays. They're not ruled errors. I feel like they probably should have been ruled errors. One of them, Marcelo Zuna, inexplicably dives for a ball that I think any other outfielder in baseball probably just catches on the run, doesn't catch it. Uh, allows a runner to get to second. They rule it a hit. Uh, Matt Olson misses a uh, misses a play at first. Uh, Taylor made double play ball. You can't assume a double play. So um, the run ends up being earned. And then he makes a mistake on a single pitch to Pavin Smith. And Pavin just crushes it, I think, to right uh, for a three-run home run. So he ends up getting tagged with five runs in the outing. Um, and I think maybe, I think really think only one of them, uh, the home run would have been his fault. The guys that were on after the home run shouldn't have been on. Uh, again, I think should have been errors. And then the other runs were on because of the Matt Olson error. So uh, 13 walks, 44 strikeouts. And he's really kind of flashed an amazing arsenal. So when you look at what he's done, um, throw in 100 easy, just easy, smooth, 100 mile an hour gas. And and doing just enough with the off speeds to kind of take some guys, kind of leave them a little bit surprised. So obviously fastball is that big pitch. Um, the Braves told him to get rid of the changeup, 
kind of get rid of the curveball. So what he's been doing is he's been elevating the fastball. So it's upper 90s, 99, 100, high in the zone. And then they're combining that with like a vertical plane slider down in the zone. And so he's getting strikeouts almost 40% of the time. I mean, uh, when he is walking somebody, it's the, the slider finishing out of the zone, finishing too low. Um, or it's the fastball being a little bit too high, missing the zone high or missing the zone inside. He unleashed the changeup for the first time, I think all season, in the start on Monday. Uh, got quite a few swings and misses with it. Looked really good. And I think that he has a chance to stick as the as the number five arm in Atlanta for a while. Uh, showed a lot of good stuff. Again, great mustache game. So, Spencer Strider, guy that's been really fun to watch. Uh, another guy, Christopher Morrell for the Cubs. So, um, was called up because of a lot of injuries. They had to get him, they had to get him up and get him helping out. And he's played all over the diamond. So, uh, they have had him. I mean, one of the best arms, international free agent in 2015. Been in the system for a while, uh, but right now, 14 of 49. Two home runs, three doubles, um, five RBIs, and then on the base paths, five stolen bases and eight runs scored. And then to do all of this, and then also 13 games in the field at four different positions, so 110 innings or so, one total error. He's played six games at second, six games at center, three games at third, and a game at shortstop. So he's playing all over the, the diamond, just about, um, for the Cubs. Playing defense well enough, and then hitting, running, doing everything you can ask for. So I don't know how much of this is is um, going to stick. I mean, we knew he was a plus runner. We knew he was an above average defender. We knew his arm strength was fantastic. The accuracy is not quite there. Uh, and the scouting report, you know, we knew that his raw power was like plus plus, plenty of bat speed, but he struggled with velocity high and inside. Um, you know, his swing oftentimes couldn't catch up to to fastballs. Uh, he'd swing and miss a bunch, and we just haven't seen that yet. So I wonder how much of this, once the league has seen enough of him to adjust, how much of this is going to stick. But for right now. Uh, fantasy baseball tip. If you need a guy who's in Yahoo already has tons of positional versatility or an ESPN is going to get it soon, go pick up Christopher Morrell. In a month, he's going to be eligible at probably second, third, and the outfield. So super useful there for you. Uh, another guy, played. Or, speaking of playing around quite a bit, is um, Juan Yepes. So another player um, in this you know, in this Cardinal system. And the thing here is 24 games now, um, nine in left field, five in right field, uh, seven DH, two at first, because obviously you've got a pretty decent guy at first in Paul Goldschmidt. Um, but he's appeared in five games where they've taken, had to take Goldie out for something or they've given him some rest, whatever. And then offensively, 24 of 87, four home runs, four doubles, 14 runs, and eight RBIs. So a guy where as long as you've, while you've got all these injuries in St. Louis, you've got, um, you know, you've got some outfield spots open. You've got a little bit of time of, of, um, you got a DH role you can fill from time to time. Absolutely, I can see Yep is sticking up. The question is, is he going to do enough to stick once everybody's healthy again. And I don't quite know the answer to that. Um, You know, he's been been around since 2015. He was in the Braves system. He's kind of moved around a bit. Um, I, you know, and even now, he's only batting 276. So I don't know how much of this is going to be how much they're going to use him when everyone's healthy. Um, But he's one of the better hitters for average in the system. And I mean, still a top 10 prospect. So you have to think last year, Pujols, when Pujols is done, there's probably a path there to DH, play a, uh, 
play an occasional um, corner outfield. I wouldn't say it's great. He's a below average runner. Feels like he's kind of a below average defender. He's been fine. He hasn't been great. Um, But I just wonder how much he's going to be able to continue to play when everybody's healthy. At the same time, that may not happen this season. That's just kind of the reality. And this is something we talk about a lot on this show. Depth will work itself out. If you feel like you have too many options, well, guess what? Somebody's going to get hurt and you'll take care of it. And then the last guy is a guy we've talked about on the show before, but somebody that I'm just, I'm always really excited to talk about and to watch is MJ Melendez. So um, he's, I mean, obviously catcher. I'm going to go ahead and call him a right fielder now. He's got 15 games at catcher. In the 23 games, he's been up five at DH, one in right field. Let's call him an outfielder. Um, but 20 to 77, four home runs, four doubles, a triple. How many catchers hit triples? Nine RBIs and nine runs. And it's something you're you're watching the very end of the Carlos Santana career. Um, not playing well. And I think the decision to move on from, from Santana is going to come sooner rather than later. If the Royals were contending, it would have already happened. But I think that um, between Salvador, you know, Salvador Perez probably going to be moving to more of a DH first role than a catching first role. Melendez can slot in as the primary catcher. Uh, you'll have some guys to get called up, and we'll get to that in the third segment, who can play some first base around where Santana was and things like that. But Melendez playing well. Want him to continue to be up, joining the youth movement along with the Bobby Witt. Hopefully some other guys come in behind him uh, from Kansas City. And in just a minute, I do want to kind of talk about some of these promotions I expect to see in the next month or two. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Uh, our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can get the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's um, NBA Finals, Major League Baseball scores, fights, NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, uh, live betting, playoffs, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because Bet Online is, when the, is where the game starts. So a couple guys that I think are going to get called up recently. And, in, uh, and until just a few days ago, Sam Bachman was on this list. We talked about him in the Angels, so the right-hand pitcher. Uh, missed the beginning of the season because of a back injury. Had three games in double A. Um, we've already seen one of their guys come up. Chase Silseth was one of the first guys promoted. And so it seemed kind of inevitable that Sam Bachman was going to get promoted sooner rather than later. Um, took himself out of a game recently with some back issues. So I think that's probably backed off a little bit as far as, um, as far as when they're going to, when he's going to come up, um, when he's going to come up. But to go along with that, a uh, Max Meyer. Um, it's something where third pick 2020 draft, he's in triple a, he's got that amazing slider, 44 strikeouts and 39 innings. And I think that part of the reason people don't think he's about to come up is because they look at the ERA. He's got a four, five, four ERA. You have to understand the, uh, the offensive friendly environment that he's playing in, in triple a, um, he's giving up less hits, uh, less walks. Less home runs per nine innings than the average, like than the team average. He would improve this team. And I think as Trevor Rogers continues to struggle, and as the Marlins think like they're close enough to the expanded playoffs where they have a shot, you're gonna see them go ahead and and uh and call up Max Meyer and give him a chance. And uh talking about teams that are gonna call up a pitcher. <laughs> Uh, the Dodgers with Bobby Miller. So right-hand pitcher Bobby Miller, tw- uh, 29th pick in 2020. He's a big right-hander. Fastball can hit 100. He needs to get better with commanding the secondary offerings uh, and then going a little deeper in the games. He's only averaging about 15 batters per uh, per start this season, just, just over or just under two full times through the order. Um, and so I can kind of see Bobby Miller as a guy that the Dodgers bring up uh, start him off in like a hybrid bullpen kind of role. And then from there, decide to have him um, maybe do a spot start here and there, do a hybrid long man slash spot start kind of role, try to get him a little more stretched out 
without the stress of, hey, you have to go six innings because it's the Dodgers. One, we're going to score tons of, ton of runs. Two, we've got a great bullpen behind you. I mean, Craig Kimball's back there. Great bullpen behind you to kind of pick you up. A uh, couple other players I think that you that we're probably going to be seeing the big league level, catcher Gabriel Moreno. So um, s- slash line over 27 games, something like 333, 393, 441. Uh, and I think the only thing that may stop him from showing up right now is Danny Jansen and Alejandro Kirk have both played pretty well for Toronto. But I believe Jan- Jansen's already been on the IL once. Kirk's had hot and cold streaks. So I think what's going to happen is as soon as you see um, somebody struggle and or get hurt and be unavailable, there's your opening uh, for Moreno. I think he's he can contribute both offensively and defensively. He gives you the ability, if you want to move one of those guys, um, I, I would assume probably a Kirk, but if you wanted to move one of those guys, he gives you the ability to do that. And then the last guy is Vinny Pascantino. So I don't understand what we're waiting for with Vinny Pascantino. He's in AAA Omaha. First baseman for the Royals. Sorry, I should have, said, should have said that. I assume you knew. 303, 396 is the slash line. Um, 14 home runs and 165 at bats. Three stolen bases. He's doing everything. And he's not been called up because Carlos Santana, who over the last, I think, year, has an average of like, a batted average of like 164. At the same time, Pascantino's out here getting like AAA player of the week. Um, and it's just like, what at what point do you pull the plug um, on Carlos Santana? And the general manager of the Royals, J.J. Piccolo, actually addressed this just recently. And he said um, a couple of things. One... They don't want to place him in a situation where uh, he steps in feeling like he has to carry the entire offense. Okay. Two, they want to see a longer track record than what he's shown so far, which, if you're keeping score, is just 350 at-bats across the high minor. Uh, the high minors, yeah. And then the third thing is they, they're having him work on covering a hole in his swing, a specific pitch and pitch location. And so it kind of sounds like what they're doing is they're waiting for like the ideal scenario, the the perfect situation to call him up. And the fact that they're doing this, despite I believe having the worst record in baseball, I think they've passed the Reds now, tells me that they're prioritizing the, the ideal situation for every single prospect over winning baseball games. And the frustrating thing is, if you're going to do that, just say that. But everything that they're doing, they're coming out and they're talking about, they're, you know, they're 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 trying to win major league games. They're committed to winning at the big league level, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yet, caveat, caveat, caveat on why you can on why you can't call this guy up. And it's very, very... If you have an OPS over 1,000 at AAA, you probably don't need to be at AAA. I think it's very obvious for all of us to say Vinny Pascantino does not need to be in AAA anymore. And so, if you want to... If you want to keep him down because you are more focused on developing prospects than winning games, that's fine. Say that. But at the same time, know that guys like MJ Melendez, who were considered not, who was considered not to be ready as well, injuries forced them to bring him up. He's putting quality at bats together. He's performing well, and so what are you waiting for? I understand Carlos Santana is making ten and a half million dollars this year, but guess what? In baseball, that's guaranteed. He's making that money whether you run him out there the rest of the year or you cut him tomorrow. At some point in time, you've got to pull the plug and either do what you say you're trying to do, which is win games, or admit 
that you're keeping him down for service time and or just to build the perfect scenario for him before you call him up. Okay, going to get off the soapbox now. Uh, great rest of the week coming up. Uh, I, we did not talk about any Pirates players today because tomorrow Ethan Smith is coming on, host of Locked On Pirates. We're going to talk all about this farm system, some of their pro- some of their promotions, or Ruanzi Contreras, some other guys, and some of the guys who have not been promoted, like O'Neill Cruz. So stick around. Going to be a great conversation. But until then, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. Mm-hmm.